In Lecture 18, we've got quite a lot to do. You can see we've got quite a lot of topics. Partially, this is review. I'm going to go through the slides pretty fast. We've got a lot of slides to get through and a lot of content in those slides. I have already posted the slides on the shared folder. So you may prefer today just sitting and listening and, and thinking. Don't let your mind wander. Make sure you focus and think if you do that, okay? Though if you find that taking notes is helpful for you, you can take notes to some degree uh, still to try to pay attention as well as you can. So it's a variety of topics. Some of this is a review. Um, the new thing in Zoom Lecture 18A is the alternative method for quotients and the derivatives of logs and inverse payments. And then Lecture 18B is all really new things, including an introduction to multivariable calculus, which is not in Chapter 3 of the book. But the physics department would like us especially to introduce <coughs> multivariable calculus a little bit early. And so that's where I'm trying to work it in. And you'll be applying it in the context of certain problems from this book, which can be thought of as ordinary derivatives, but I'll let you know that they can also be thought of as partial derivatives, and I have mentioned what those things are before. I didn't get my clicker today. I, I went to the library. They didn't have it. They didn't have any more clickers. So I have to go low tech today and reach over to the keyboard, but we'll adjust here. All right, this first slide is probably something you can just focus on listening to. Um, you remember how on Monday we talked about how proving the existence of square root of 2 is a difficult thing? I didn't actually do it. I did a different proof. I proved that if square root of 2 exists, it must be irrational. Okay, that was the thing involving the even and odd numbers in the ratio that we pretended equaled square root of 2 and we got a contradiction sign saying that square root of 2 cannot be a fraction of two whole numbers. But then I mentioned proving it exists while it is an issue because we saw the decimal expansion goes on forever and ever without a repeated pattern. I said it was hard to do. It was based on something called the completeness axiom. Actually, if you use something called the intermediate value theorem, uh, it's a little easier to prove. But you have to trust the intermediate value theorem. Here it is, IDT. This is in the book, by the way. You might want to make a note about this in section 1.7, I believe. Let f be a function that is continuous. Uh, that word is not supposed to be no. Uh, on a closed interval. On a closed interval. So it's continu continuous over the whole interval. This notation here, by the way, that does not represent a point, and it wouldn't represent a point in this context even if I use parentheses. It represents an interval of numbers. The left end point is A, the right end point is B. Now, when you use square brackets like this instead of parentheses, you include the end points in the interval. This is just a set, a collection of numbers that is evidently the domain of this continuous function. If m is any number between f of a and f of b, then there is a number c in this interval so that f of c equals m. So if you try to imagine a general kind of graph here, so this is the x-axis here, y-axis here, and you've got this function that's continuous over this interval so you can draw its graph without picking up your writing utensil. This number right there is f of a. This number up here is f of b. M is any number between them, say right there. There is at least one number c. In this case, it would be right here, where f of c equals m. So it's a pretty reasonable sounding theorem when you draw the picture and think about it carefully. And if you believe this theorem, you can use it to prove that the square root of 2 exists because you can just apply the theorem to this function, the same function we use Newton's method on, f of x equals x squared minus 2, over this interval from 1 to 2. How is that done exactly? We can do a quick proof. So you say let f of x equal x squared minus 2. This is a quadratic, it's a polynomial. We know polynomials are continuous wherever they're defined. Note that this is continuous on the interval from A to B, which is going to be 1 to 2 here. 
why I picked the integral from 1 to 2? Because I know that f of 1 here is negative and f of 2 is positive. f of 1 is 1 squared minus 2 is negative 1, but f of 2 is 2 squared minus 2 is positive 2. The graph is going to cross the horizontal axis somewhere at square root of 2. How do you say that here in the proof? You go ahead and do the calculation. Um, since f of, same calculation is up there, f of 1 is negative 1, and f of 2 is positive 2, if m equals 0, this intermediate value theorem, which I abbreviate IVT, implies that there is a number c in this interval from 1 to 2 such that f of c equals m, which is 0. That's equivalent to c squared minus 2 equaling 0, which is equivalent to c squared equaling 2. And since c is between 1 and 2, it must be the positive square root of 2. These two things imply c is the positive square root of 2. Praise the Lord. We're done. That proves square root of 2 exists. I'm using this theorem. I have to verify the hypotheses of the theorem hold, and f is continuous, and when there's a number between f of a and f of b, I choose a and b in a convenient way to guarantee the conclusion that f of c is 0, so c squared is 2, so c must be square root of 2. Okay? It's a fairly short proof. Probably wouldn't be able to do it without me teaching it to you. I have put that on old exam ones you saw from past previous years exam ones. I didn't put it on your exam. Could I put it on your exam two? Probably not. I think I'm, we're not going to do that since that's not the main focus of exam two. But future years, I might put it on your exam one or exam two. Okay? You know, if I put it on your exam one, I'll probably tell you to watch the video earlier. But that, in a sense, does beg a question. If you're going to use the IVT, you've got to know it's true. It's got to be proved. Proving the IVT itself still requires that completeness axiom that I mentioned. So it's actually a hard proof to prove that this is true. Okay? So if we use a good tool, the hammer, we can hit that nail on the wall, right? The hammer here is the intermediate value theorem. If we try doing it without the intermediate value theorem, we'd be trying to push that hammer in the wall with our hands, and it would hurt. We wouldn't be able to do it. It would take a while. Let's quickly go over the derivation of the quotient rule with infinitesimals. I did briefly show you this on Monday. I'm going to be pretty brief again. You probably do not want to write this all down. It's probably more beneficial for you to just look at and think with me here. h of x is a quotient, f of x divided by g of x. Quotient means fraction. We want to find how h gets nudged when x gets nudged. By nudge, I mean changed by an infinitesimal amount, dx. Well, f and g are going to get nudged, nudged by df and dg. What's the nudge? Nudge dh to h. There it is as a difference of two fractions. Does that make sense? Again, you've got to keep in mind, even though you don't see any x's in there, that x is in the picture. It's just in the background. Okay? I'm not bothering to write it because it makes it more confusing. Okay? It makes it more messy. dh is its value, of the ratio of the nudge values of f and g, minus the original values of f and g as a quotient. Just the difference of two function outputs for each. What should you do? Do the only thing you can do here, subtract the fractions. 
which means you need a common denominator of g times in parentheses g plus dg. You'd have to multiply this fraction on the top and bottom by g over g. That's why you get the extra g right there. And you'd have to multiply this fraction on the top and the bottom by g plus dg. That's why you get the extra g plus dg right there. Again, the x is in the background. We're just not bothering to write it. Do a bit of simplification. Use the distributive property. Multiply the g through here, f times g, and then you also get g, g times df. Subtract f times this. In other words, essentially multiply through the parentheses, negative f through the parentheses. So you have two negative signs. You got minus f times g, and you also have minus f times dg. All divided by, on the bottom still, g times g plus dg. Which can be simplified a little bit more because the f times g is going to cancel, giving you that. This is now at the point where we need to set something with a zero, something really small, infinitesimally small. Do those things get set, set to zero? Or do they have to be unspeakably small? Again, that's my terminology. If there were any df or dg squared, we'd get rid of those because they'd be unspeakably small. Turns out, you ignore the dg, but only in the bottom. And this is the big scratch your head. Like, why do we only ignore it in the bottom? How is this possibly valid? If you feel confused, you should be confused, because it is confusing. It produces the right answer in the end, but it's like, why do it that way instead of some other way? If we ignore the dg in the bottom, the bottom just becomes g squared. And we start to see the quotient rule. Low d high minus high d low over the square of what's below, except without any x's in there. But again, the x's are in the background. So again, that it's just like, why just in the bottom? You could partially justify it by saying it gets you the right answer, but what if you didn't know the right answer? It has to be mysterious. Okay, this, this is not a rigorous method. And again, when I was in your shoes, it bothered me. So I'm like, how do I know to do that? And it's partially just because the teacher tells you to. And you kind of have to accept it unless you want to get into that non-standard analysis. Okay? It can be made rigorous, by the way, with limits. It can be, but that's, that's kind of beside the point of what we're doing. We try to be extra rigorous with limits. Divide everything by dx. We get the x's back in. There's the answer to Leibniz notation. Here's the quotient rule in ordinary function notation. Okay? So you might say, if you're like me at least, hey, this is kind of fun. But if you scratch your head wondering why it works, I understand. Because it does feel confusing even to me. It's like, why get rid of dg in just the bottom but not in the top? other than just to say it gets you to the right answer. Okay. And again, if you take a lot of physics, especially maybe even physical chemistry, you'll be doing this kind of thought process, not just with derivatives, but also with integrals. You'll see. And so it's good to get practice on it, even if you don't feel like you completely understand it. It's sort of one of those things that you just sort of get. You don't completely get. Okay, you have to just accept that. What about the chain rule? Let's spend a little bit more time with its derivation today. Again, the chain rule is the derivative of a composition, f of g of x. It tells you how to take the derivative of that. Here's the derivation. It's actually fairly quick. Essentially, you, you do a little trick of introducing a new variable into the situation. It's, it's helpful to do this, at least. Sometimes functions are imagined as machines. Maybe you had a teacher who drew function machines before. When I think about f of g of x, again, g gets done first. You plug the number x into the inner function, in this case, g first, to get an output, g of x. All 
I'm doing here in this, with this new letter u is I'm just saying let that equal u. It's just a definition of a new variable. And then you take that number, whatever it is, and plug it into the outer function f. These functions are chained together to create one big function, in a sense, f circle g. Circle. They're chained together. That's why it's called the chain rule. What comes out? What comes out can be written as of g of x, it can also be written f of u, because u equals g of x. Just defining a new variable, which is fine to do. Now nudge x by dx. What do we ultimately want to find? We want to find out how much y gets nudged. Where y is f of u is f of g of x. There's this intermediate stage. u gets nudged first. What happens? You can write du is g prime of x dx. Where did that equation come from? Well, think of it as a rate of change. It's the rate of change of u with respect to x times the little change in x. This is essentially linearization. Tangent line approximation in a sense. Except we're writing an equal sign because these are infinitesimal changes. Corresponding approximate equation we wrote before was delta y is approximate of f prime of x times delta x. That's one way to write it. Alternatively, you can write it as f of x minus f of a is approximately, I should really write an a here, f prime of a times x minus a. Those are true approximate equations we've seen already. This is an quote unquote exact version of these approximate equations. Instead of using delta x and delta y, we use du and dx. I guess I'll use the u here as well, but I'm changing the letter here. Pretend that's an equal sign. Pretend these are exact qualities because dx is so tiny that this really does give you the exact change in the function. The function g in this case, which is du. This leads to a chain reaction. If u changes a little bit, then so does y, because y depends on u. You can also write that. dy is f prime of u dy. To finish this, essentially now, you just replace this du here with this product. And that essentially is the chamber in what I call differential form. We still want to need to divide by both sides by dx. That's what we do next. And we get the chain. And in the final form over here, the u gets replaced by gx, g of x. So I think a little bit intuitive sense. Think about it with numbers. You know, If a tiny change in x causes u to change by, say, twice as much, twice as fast, and a tiny change in u causes y to change by three times as much, three times as fast, you would expect the composition, the chain, to result in the following. If x changes by a tiny amount, y changes by two times three times as much, six times as fast. You can think about it with numbers that way, it can make intuitive sense. Again, this is not a proof. It's just an intuitive derivation. With Leibniz notation, you can write the chain in this way. By the way, on homework, the completion homework due Friday, you're going to encounter some problems that are going to be harder and are a bit more abstract, you should be able to deal with the chain rule and the product and quotient rule in abstract form as well. Here's an example of a kind of thing you might have to do. You might be given 
uh, that perhaps g of 3 equals 5, g prime of 3 equals 2, and you might be told that f prime of 5 equals 7. And finally, you might be told that h of x is f of g of x. And your goal is to find h prime of 3. Looks like it's hard, but it's actually not if you're just careful. It is set up to use the chain rule. In general, h prime of x is what? Think about the chain rule here. This is the outer function. There's the inner function. It's the derivative of the outer function evaluated at the inner, inner function times the derivative of the inner function. And that works if you plug numbers in as well. h prime of 3 will be f prime of g of 3 times g prime of 3. g of 3 is 5. And lo and behold, we are given f prime of 5 and g prime of 3. This is 7 times 2. The answer is 14. So it's set up to work as long as you do it carefully. Another kind of example is you might be told that h of x is f of, say, square root of x. You might also be told See, I've got to be careful here. That um, f of 2 is 5, and f prime of 2 is 4. Hopefully, I'm not making a mistake here. And you're told to find h prime of 4. Well, there's no g of x seemingly in here, but this is g of x right there. That is the g of x. So the derivative here, h prime of x, is the derivative of the outside function. Plug in the inside function. Multiply that times the derivative of the inside function. That's x to the 1 half. Its derivative by the power rule is one half x to the negative one half. So you get here when you simplify f prime of square root of x divided by two times square root of x for h prime of x. So h prime of four is going to be f prime of square root of four divided by two times square root of four. That's f prime of 2 divided by 2 times 2 is 4. f prime of 2 is given to be 4. Lots of 4s here. You get a final answer of 1. Okay? So you should be able to handle things like this. Just practice with the chain rule, and it could occur in problems with the quotient rule and the product rule as well. Um, I'm going to skip this slide for today. It is an alternative method for the quotients. I probably will go over it quickly on Friday, but it is here if you feel like looking at it in the shared folder. You can always avoid the quotient rule as the point, because you could write a function f divided by g as f times g to the negative 1. And sometimes people prefer that when they take derivatives. But I'm going to skip that for today. In the time we have remaining before the break in the quiz, I want to derive the derivative of logarithms and the derivative of the arc function. How do you find the derivative of a general logarithm, say log base b of x, where b is an arbitrary base? The first step is to use the definition of a logarithm. Log base b of x. 
is the number b must be raised to to get x. So if you raise b to that number, you get x. But it's the inverse function of b to the x. Use that fact, which is true as long as x is positive. And if you assume the logarithm function is differentiable, you can differentiate both sides and use the chain rule like, like follows. I haven't used the chain rule yet. I'm just emphasizing and differentiating both sides. If these two functions are equal, which they are when x is positive, then the derivatives have to be equal. And the derivative of x is 1. But what's the derivative of this? Well, we don't know what that equals yet fully, but we can partially differentiate it. It is a composition. b to the x is the outside function. Log base b of x is the inside function. I need the chain rule to differentiate that. So I take the derivative of the outside function, b to the x, which you already know. And you need to know, possibly for the quiz, the derivative of b to the x is, say it loud, natural log of b times b to the x. And when b is e, natural log of e is 1, so the natural log part goes away. So the derivative of that is this, except I have to plug in the inside function there. This is the derivative of v to the x, except I have to evaluate it at the inside function, times the derivative of the inside function. That's the chain rule right there. Kind of complicated, but you could do it if you were careful. And the chain rule says take the derivative of the outside function, plug in the inside function into that. So, multiply times the derivative of the inside function. And that's an equation we can just solve algebraically for the derivative of the log base b of x. Like that. Just divide both sides by natural log of b times v to the log base b of x. Kind of a nasty looking derivative, but it can be simplified. Because this, this can be simplified just to x. Yeah. There's the answer, written in a couple slightly different forms. Either way is OK. And lo and behold, if b equals e, natural log of e is 1, that natural log goes away. And you just get 1 over x, nice and simple. Isn't that amazing? The derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. And here you can check it graphically as well. The red graph is giving you the slope of the blue graph. The slopes of the blue graph are always positive. The outputs of the red graph are always positive. The blue graph is concave down. Its slopes are decreasing. The output of the red is decreasing. And if you check, if you drew in some tangent lines at any various points, you can check the derivative right there, for example, by drawing a tangent line and trying to estimate the rise of a run, here, when x is 5, you'd probably get a value around 0.1 or 0.2 or so is the output there. Okay? This is not on today's quiz, but it could be on future quizzes. General the derivative of log base b of x is that, and the derivative of natural log of x is 4 degrees. When x is positive, we're only talking about the domain of the natural log function. Or the, or the log function. What about the derivative of inverse tangent? Again, also called arc tangent. It's a similar derivation, though it is tricky. In the end, at least. By definition, tangent of inverse tangent of x equals x. This is actually true for all x. Any real number x, this is true. The domain of the inverse tangent function is the entire real number line. You may remember its graph look like this. It's got two distinct different horizontal asymptotes at plus or minus pi over 2. <coughs> and, uh, differentiate both sides. Once again, once again, the derivative of the right side is just a 1. For the left side, use the chain rule. Derivative of tangent plug in the inverse tangent into that derivative, then multiply times the derivative of inverse tangent, which we don't yet know. 
but we can still write it symbolically. The derivative of tangent we saw on Monday, right, it was secant squared. By the way, that's something you should memorize for the gateway in future quizzes. It can be derived, but it's probably worth memorizing the derivative of tangent is secant squared. But I plug in the inside function, then I take the derivative of the inside function, and I don't know that derivative yet, but now I can solve for it. Divide both sides by this. When you divide by secant squared, it's the same as multiplying both sides by what? Cosine squared. Cosine squared. So a cosine comes in seemingly by magic. It's not magic. Secant is defined to be 1 over secant plus, or 1 over cosine. So if I divide both sides by secant, I'm really multiplying both sides by cosine, and that happens with their squares too. So I guess that's the answer. And it is the answer. However, it's not the usual form for the answer. Somewhat mysteriously, that thing equals 1 over 1 plus x squared. What? Really? Yes, it does, really. Why? Well, this is not a proof, but it's a quick picture that helps you believe it. Draw a right triangle and label one of the angles as inverse tangent of x. What? Why can I do that? Well, remember, when you can think of the input to cosine, sine, and tangent as being angles if you want. Therefore, you can think of their, the outputs of the inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent as being angles. And I want to of you. You can call it theta if you want, but you don't have to. Then remember, hey, the ta Sokotoa, tangent toa, is opposite over adjacent. The ratio of this side to this side has got to be the tangent of this angle, which is x. Right? Tangent of this is x. So maybe I should just write an x here and a 1 here. Is that OK? It is. I could also write a 2x and a 2, or a 3x and a 3, but it's simplest just to label them x and 1. By the Pythagorean theorem, this side's got to have length of 1 square root of 1 plus x squared, because when you square that, you've got to get the sum of the squares of these things. And the cosine of an angle, so ka, is adjacent over hypotenuse adjacent array of hypotenuse, 1 over square root of 1 plus x squared. That's exactly what you see in here. Then I have to square that to get this. So that's the more common form of the derivative of inverse tangent. And you can see it graphically too. The red graph is the derivative. Its outputs are giving you the slopes of the blue graph. This is the graph of inverse tangent. Slopes are always positive, so the outputs of the red are always positive. Slope is maximized when x is 0. That's the output of the red is maximized when x is 0. That graph helps you believe it. Okay. All right, we'll stop the lecture A there. Take the quiz.